News coming into our newsroom. We have reports of a shooting in West Bear County involving a sheriff's deputy. It happened just after 8 this morning off of Petranco Road near the Sundance Ridge neighborhood. We're told the deputy is okay and a suspect was taken to the hospital. Part of Petranco Road is closed due to the ongoing investigation. Now waiting to hear more from Katrina Weber. She is on her way to the scene. Look for updates in this newscast and online at ksat.com. And for now, let's look at today's 9 at 9. The countdown to a possible shutdown continues. Government funding expires tomorrow at 12.01 a.m. This morning, the Senate is voting on a bill to keep the government funded through early December. Once the Senate acts, the House is expected to take up the measure. There is new evidence revealed in the Gabby Petito investigation. The FBI now has surveillance video from a park where Brian Laundrie went camping earlier this month. They also have video from an AT&T store where he purchased a cell phone three days after returning to Florida. Laundrie has only been named as a person of interest in the investigation. A legal win for Britney Spears. A judge has suspended the singer's father, Jamie Spears, as conservator of her estate. The singer and lawyer have chosen a temporary replacement to oversee her finances. A hearing to consider ending the conservatorship is set for November 12th. Nearly 600 United Airlines employees are without a job this morning. The move comes as the airline hits the deadline for its COVID-19 vaccine mandate. The company says more than 99% of its U.S.-based employees met the company vaccine requirement. 593 employees chose not to comply. Beginning tomorrow, the Postal Service will have new standards that will delay delivery times for some mail. Some first-class mail will arrive later, especially if traveling a long distance. The current one to three day delivery service will now be one to five days. Postmaster General says the changes are to save billions of dollars. The International Olympic Committee announced only people who live in mainland China will be able to get tickets for the 2022 Winter Olympic Games in Beijing. The IOC hasn't announced details of the health and safety requirements, but they say athletes who are not fully vaccinated will have to quarantine for 21 days. The NCAA says a women's basketball championship tournament will be part of March Madness branding starting in 2022. The women's final four is scheduled for April 1st through the 3rd in Minneapolis. The men's national championship game is April 4th in New Orleans. Google is adding a new wildfire layer to Google Maps. You'll be able to see the latest details about multiple fires all at the same time. There will also be links to things like emergency websites and information about evacuations and road closures. The wildfire map layer will be available on Android smartphones this week and on iPhones in October. Rolls-Royce says by 2030 it will only produce electric cars. Testing is set to start soon on its first electric model and the company plans to have it on the road in late 2023. And that's today's 9 at 9. Steph, for it seems like over a year now, we've talked about how the housing market is red hot. Yeah, it's really hot, according to this article. So hot, a burn house is going for big money in the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts. Yeah, I guess it's the asking price is $399,000. For a burned home, people. It's amazing. Yeah, WBZ TV reported this earlier this week. This house is in uh, Melrose, a suburb of Boston, and evidence of how hot the Mars market is. Here, okay, here's the scene. Wow. So the online listing for the burned three bedroom, it's 1,800 square feet, starts with a call out to contractors and continues. House is in need of complete renovation or potential <laughs> tear down and rebuild. Buyer to do diligence, house being sold as is. Oh, Look at that. Look yeah. at that video. Oh my it, goodness. This house in uh, Melrose, Mass, suffered an intense fire uh, late this summer that blew out the front windows, which are now boarded up. Yeah, the Boston Globe reported that firefighters had to tear out parts of the walls and the ceiling of the home to extinguish the blaze. I'm not familiar with that area, but I wonder if this is a, a high, like a very popular area, perhaps. I, yeah, I can't tell from this video at all, but it looks like a fairly large house, or at least it was. Again, the asking price, $399 thousand dollars. I don't know how it'll be interesting for a follow-up if, if they actually get someone to pay that. We'll have to keep an eye on it for you. I think so. Let's go ahead and take a look outside with live cam. Uh, it's been I guess a little calmer this morning than it was yesterday. Yeah, it is quite a bit calmer. We've got some cloud cover. It's a little bit humid, but not a lot of rain out there on the radar, at least not yet. We're not expecting a whole lot today. I think most of your Thursday will be 
fairly quiet. As we get into tonight, things do start to change a little bit. Let's look at the radar. We have a couple of showers down there along the coast. These are generally pretty light and staying mostly out in the Gulf of Mexico, but a couple of downpours there uh, just to the south and southeast of Goliad and Victoria. That's all we have on the radar at this hour. Temperature wise, 76 at the airport, 75 Randolph, 76 out in Gonzales. You're at 71 in comfort. A lot of humidity out there. And here are the headlines. You see the sun starting to pop out already. We'll see more of that this afternoon. Partly cloudy skies, a couple of isolated storms. Uh, again, we're not expecting much, about a 30% chance of rain. Then tonight, storms will develop off to our west and northwest. Some of those could be strong. And as they come together and work their way south and southeast, they could be affecting us by tomorrow morning. So that brings up the big question tomorrow. How does it all time out? I think we get some storms early, maybe a little bit quieter in the, during the afternoon, but it all depends on what develops overnight. We'll jump into all of that coming up here in just a few minutes. But the bottom line forecast today, 90 degrees, 30 percent chance of rain and better chances tonight. Your complete forecast coming up here in just a couple of minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Sounds good. A quick look at the roads with Transguy. Things a lot more calmer this morning on the roadways as well. There's a quick look there at I-35 at Loop 1604. Top stories we're following for you today. Other than that late breaking news we mentioned at the top of the newscast, San Antonio police say at least two people are in serious condition after a head-on crash overnight. It happened just before midnight on the city's northwest side at the intersection of Prue Road and Kyle Sill Parkway, just east of Bandera. Police say the two vehicles were speeding at the time of the crash. That's right. Officers say one was possibly in the wrong lane, racing the other when it collided head-on with another vehicle. No other injuries were reported. And firefighters are trying to figure out what sparked an apartment fire last night just north of downtown. This one happened around 1015 in the 300 block of West Laurel. That's where crews say a fire broke out in a wall between the first and second floor of an apartment building. Crews were able to put out the flame pretty quickly and no one was hurt. People who lived in three apartment units were displaced last night. Still no word on the cause of the fire. Police are trying to figure out what led to a shooting overnight on the city's west side. It happened around 1230 this morning in the 2900 block of West Salinas near North Zarzamora Street. And San Antonio police say they are getting conflicting statements from witnesses, but they say two men were shot in the leg and taken to the hospital. All right, so we know two people were held in connection with the shooting, uh, but we don't know anything else right now. We're going to bring you an update on this story as information becomes available. In your other morning headlines, the, that volcano in the Canary Islands causing more and more problems now that lava has reached the ocean and a military vet uses a trash can to battle an alligator. David Sears is here to explain all that. D I Dave, you and I were chatting earlier. This may be the video of the week. I, I think so. I, I took a peek at it. Oh my goodness. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah, the, the vet wins, by the way. Well, yes, yes. Which good news. Yeah. Veteran one good alligator. Spirit. Yeah, we'll show, you, we'll show you how all that happens in just a second. It took about 10 days, but lava flowing from a volcano on the Isle of La Palma has reached the Atlantic Ocean, and that is not a good thing. When the lava hits the water, toxic gases are created, so authorities are telling folks that they need to shelter in place on that island. Before it reached the ocean, the lava flow went through the neighborhoods, pretty much destroying everything in its path. Lava has taken out homes and churches and businesses. The island has been declared a disaster zone. From the category of video sweeping the nation, we bring you veteran versus alligator. That is Eugene Bozy with his big trash can going after an alligator in the neighbor's front yard. Bozy letting his military training kick in along with his fatherhood instincts. He's not backing down. Matter of fact, he's leading the charge against that prehistoric beast and finally captured it in that big trash can. Although the gator was putting up a pretty good fight, thrashing that tail around. Might have got to step up and do something. We all got to look out for each other, right? I was right when I had it in it because it, it was so powerful. And I inspect that, and it was pushing itself out, we're whipping this tail around. By the way, Bozy is actually from Philly, so you know he's a tough guy, but there's something about fighting a six foot alligator. They were able to get the gator out of their yard down an embankment to a retention pond. Bozy was able to get his trash can back as well. He leaves it there, and then he runs back and gets it later after the alligator gets out. Like, Give me that. You don't need that trash can. And there goes the alligator. Nobody got hurt, not even the gator. Orange County tweeted out, though, that people should call the state's nuisance line for alligators so a licensed trapper can take over. Why? He's got it. I don't know. That might be one of the techniques they use from now on. Right? right? There. I mean, he, he could be licensed. I guess <laughs> yeah. he could get that. Oh, my goodness. All right. Now let's take it to Maine. That's uh, one big fish right there. And this is not a fish story that you might think because we're not exaggerating. 
We are there in Bangor, Maine. The crew fishing for lobster, but lo and behold, they pulled in the catch of a lifetime. That is a 600 pound tuna. However, by law, they were not supposed to keep it. The crew figured the fish was not going to be revived, so it was just going to go to waste if they had to throw it back. So the owner called one of his buddies with the Marine Patrol, and he gave them the OK to keep the monster tuna instead of selling it. Then they had to get the OK from the state so they could donate that fish to a local soup kitchen right there. I thought it was the most wonderful thing in the world. <laughs> we do the uh, menus for the Belfast Soup Kitchen a week ahead of time. Everybody was looking for it. It wasn't on the menu last week, so we made sure we put it on the menu this week. And when I put it on, I said, yes, the big tuna. I like it. It makes my heart feel good to see all the people coming and going, benefiting from it. Yeah, the captain could have sold that tuna for about $10,000, but he said it was good to see the people enjoying it. By the way, a little tidbit for you. It took five people nearly five hours to fillet that big fish. And finally this morning, those are robots visiting the St. Louis Aquarium, but they are more than just ordinary robots. Those are the eyes and ears of patients from the Children's Hospital there in St. Louis. They call it reverse patient outing. The kids logged into the robots and then were able to go around the aquarium and see all kinds of fish and sea otters and sharks. The hospital said it was a way for the children to use modern technology for a positive experience. It was the first time the robots had actually left the hospital and took the kids out on a field trip. What a remarkable Aww. idea. How about that, huh? And you can see the, the kids as well. Yeah, that's, that's great stuff. So they're, they're in the screen. They just pull up and check out the fish. Very so, good. There you go. Thank so, you, two fish stories. <laughs> two, yes. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Right now, 909, about 76 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. Good morning, a historic building on the city's west side is getting a major facelift. Why? To help preserve Latino and Hispanic culture, and they're doing it through books. All the details just ahead here on GMSA at 9. 913 on San Antonio's west side, you can find some art, culture, and community, but also low literacy rates and an economic struggle. A new bookstore and gift shop hopes to change that by providing a space where the stories, achievements, and experiences of Hispanics and Latinos across the U.S. are made available. Alicia Barrera is live from the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center with more on the new edition and when you can start to shop. Alicia, good morning. Good morning, you guys. Well, many probably remember this black and white building behind me. It's historic here on the west side. It used to be Progreso Pharmacy, but now it's gotten a huge facelift. It's going to be a bookstore and why it's going to be showcasing specifically Hispanic and Latino talent. There aren't many places that showcase Latino and Hispanic talent. Well, unfortunately, we have low literacy rates. Um, of course, it's a book desert, just like it's a food desert sometimes. Ironically, not even on the city's west side, where memoirs of cultural identity are painted all along the walls. It's a resource desert in many ways, in many areas, but it's not a cultural desert. This is a culturally rich area. But now slowly, the shelves are filling up with color and history. Given that we are a multidisciplinary center at the Guadalupe and we like to cover the literary arts as well, I thought it would be important to have a hub you know, of literary offerings and academic offerings and children's offerings as well. The project has been five years in the making and made possible with bond funding from the city of San Antonio of more than $1 million we will have all the well-known Latino authors that we can think of. Um, you know, immediately we'll have people like Carmen Tafoya, Sandra Cisneros, um, many authors, some, some of the poet laureates. Publishings from independent to local and academic university presses will be featured along with art from Latinos of all walks of life. It's not easy for Latino authors to get into bookstores. It's not easy for uh, Latino artisans to get their products into stores. This will be the place for them. And, and then for the neighborhood as well. 
Well, the grand opening is tomorrow at 1 p.m., so if you want to come check it out, the details are listed on your screen now. Uh, the grand opening again at 1 p.m. It's followed by a book reading by Carmen Tafoya and Tomas Ibarra Fausto. That's happening at 6.30 in the evening. The celebration does continue across the street at 8 p.m. with a performance by the Guadalupe Dance Company. The dance company is actually cel celebrating 30 years of existence, so you can buy your tickets for that event. We'll have all the details listed online, but the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center wants to remind the public that they are opening, but it is going to be at a smaller scale. So don't go in expecting Barnes and Noble, but do go in spe uh, expecting to find a lot of rich culture that, of course, you can see it all across the west side, but across Texas and the nation. Reporting live from the city's west side, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Well, thank you, Alicia. Very exciting that the grand opening is tomorrow, and we'll wait for it to expand. Thank you, Alicia. Well, to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, KSAT's hosting a coloring contest to see who has the best coloring skills. And we already have a few submissions, so let's go ahead and take a look. Oh, there you go. Lots of color. So the contest details can be found on KSAT.com. It's pretty simple. You can find the story on our website, and you can just download the coloring template, color it, then upload it to the website, and we're, well, the web team, not, not me and Mark, the web team will pick some of the best ones to be entered into a random drawing, and whoever wins will take home an iPad mini. So the contest ends October 8th and the winner will be announced right here on GMSA. And good luck to you. We had Ben Spicer from our web team on the other day talking about this contest. All right, so a, a reprieve from the storms, and already we see some activity, but it looks like it's way out in the Gulf right now, Justin. Yeah, that's all we have on the radar right now, Mark, is just some showers and storms out there in the Gulf. And I think most of today, today is going to be fairly quiet. This evening and tonight, though, we're going to have to watch the radar pretty closely. So let's jump in right, uh, right now and show you where those storms are at the moment. Uh, out the south and east of Victoria, we do see one little cell there. Otherwise, um, one little shower around sea drift, that's it. And uh, with just a few clouds out there, uh, well, we have actually quite a bit of cloud cover, but these clouds are not producing any rain. Uh, Temperature-wise, 76 at the airport. Dew point is at 74. It is very humid. Easterly winds at 5 miles per hour. And temperatures are in the 70s for the most part, with a few 80s starting to show up. On the map, 71 Comfort, 76 in Hondo, 78 Pleasanton, 76 in New Braunfels. Uh, some low 70s in the Hill Country, and then you transition to more upper 70s and 80s as you go south. Dew point tracker. It's going to be humid. We know that, and that's what's contributing to some of these uh, heavy rainfall numbers and, and forecasts that we're looking at. But the dew points do drop off as we get into Sunday, and especially Monday, Tuesday of next week. We'll get some drier air in here, and it'll feel a lot better. Uh, forecast for today, we are calling for a 30% chance of an isolated shower storm, and that starts about 3 o'clock, goes through the evening. Temperatures stop out close to 90 degrees. Here's the setup. Upper level low off to the west. That's producing showers and storms across parts of New Mexico. Far west Texas already starting to see some development there, and we'll get some disturbances working uh, in the flow aloft to help kick off some showers and storms mainly across West Texas today. So this is the severe weather risk. There is a slight risk on a scale of one to five, about a two, and that's really from Midland down to Del Rio. So this is generally west of our area, but by tonight there could be a couple strong storms out there near Del Rio. So let's look at the forecast here. We'll fast forward to six o'clock. You see some of those storms out west that potentially could be strong, and then just some isolated stuff elsewhere. By midnight and overnight, you start to see these storms, <clears throat> excuse me, really come together here and it works southeast. And that's where we get that the potential for some heavy rain. This is 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. You see some widespread showers and storms. And then that moves east and southeast by the afternoon. If the atmosphere gets pretty worked over by that, we're not going to see a whole lot more during the afternoon hours. If it skirts through and we don't see a, a lot of rain, then we could see a little bit more development tomorrow afternoon. So it's going to be highly dependent on what happens tonight on how much rain we get uh, for Friday. And of course, Friday night football, this is around 10 o'clock on Friday, still showing some isolated stuff, but maybe not widespread rain. So here's how I think it plays out rain chance wise. 60% chance tonight, 70% mainly tomorrow morning, then a 40% chance tomorrow night for Friday night football. We bring it back up to a 60% chance Saturday, and the rain chances taper off. There is a risk for some flooding rainfall, a slight risk out west tonight, west of I-35. And then as we get into tomorrow, 
it uh, spreads across the entire area and rainfall could be anywhere from one to three inches, especially west of San Antonio. So the seven day forecast 82 tomorrow, 70% chance of rain mainly in the morning, 83 Saturday, 60% chance and then less humid next week. Highs in the upper 80s. It'll feel pretty nice morning lows in the 60s, but we'll be watching closely the radar here over the next uh, 48 hours or so, guys. We will watch closely. Thank yep. you, Justin. Mm -hmm. 921, about 77 degrees. Dealing with the insurance company while having to worry about fixing up your home after a natural disaster, obviously not fun. Still ahead on GMSA at 9, we have some tips on how to manage all those insurance claims. Well, now to some advice for homeowners who may be facing damage to their home from severe weather. Dealing with insurance claims can be a long and difficult process. ABC's Rena Roy has some tips on how to make it a little bit easier. Floods, fires, hurricanes, tornadoes. These extreme weather events can be devastating for homeowners. Once the storm has passed, it's time to start the rebuilding process, and that means dealing with your homeowner's insurance. According to Consumer Reports, the first step is to file a claim with your insurance carrier as soon as you can. Even if you are not able to get to your home, it's good to at least contact the company. When you get a chance then to get more information about what's happening with your home, that's when you can fill in the details. Next, get out your phone and take a walk around your home to record the damage. Make a list of items that were destroyed or might need repair. It's very important to document as much damage as you can, both externally and internally. And of course, use your smartphone a lot to do that. If there's major damage to your home, you should take steps to prevent it from getting worse. It's important to do stopgap work even as you are just filing the claim. The insurance company does not want to see that you report something and then you wait around for it to get worse. Your insurance carrier will assign an adjuster to your claim to determine the value of any damages or losses. It's very important to record the conversations that you have with the adjuster and or just to document on paper what the conversations were so that if there are any problems or disagreements later and you have to go to court or something like that, you have documentation of what you were told. Know what your policy covers and what it doesn't. Coverage plans vary and the differences may affect what payments you'll get. And finally, be patient. It can be a very trying process. It can take some people a very long time to get everything restored and just have patience and uh, document everything. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. And to be better prepared for the future, Consumer Reports suggest that you make a home inventory. And keep it updated. It's as easy as taking a video with your phone or pictures of all the rooms and all your valuables in your house. It could save you time and a lot of uh, effort if extreme weather hits and you do have to file one of those big, big claims. And time now is 927, and there's a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. That's right. A new episode of KDX KSAT Explains is out now. Details on what to expect if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet. However, first, a local fish species is now extinct. This story is on KSAT.com right now. A look at what else is on our website with RJ Marcus. And there are several interesting stories trending this morning on KSET.com from a San Marcos fish that hasn't been seen in nearly three decades to the future of Brackenridge Park. We also have a full rundown of things happening in October, which begins tomorrow. RJ Marquez mm -hmm. joins us live here in the studio with those stories and more. Good morning. Yeah, happy Thursday. Spoiler warning here. There's a lot of stuff going on in October. So okay. From family friendly things to adult things, a lot of different things happening in the area. We'll get to that one here in just a bit, guys. But let's start uh, with this local fish tale of sorts. In a rare move, the U.S. government is giving up hope of finding 23 species, including one from up the road in San Marcos. Officials with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced the San Marcos Gambusia is one of 23 species it's seeking to remove from the Endangered Species Act. And of course, that is due to extinction. Officials say help for these species came too late and they no longer require that protection. The San Marcos Gambusia was listed on the Endangered Species Act in 1980, but it's 
last confirmed sighting was in 1983. The fish lived in clear spring water coming from the headwaters of the San Marcos River. So the full list of these extinct species is on KSAT.com. It's a very interesting list. I noticed a lot of birds on there. I don't know. I don't know why that's the case that there's a, like half of these are birds, hmm. including the ivory billed woodpecker. This is the flying bat right there. Yeah, I was looking <laughs> <Yeah>. at the bat. <laughs> yeah, but um, this is really interesting. If you guys get a chance, head over to KSAT.com to check that out. Okay, so sticking with the theme of preservation a bit here. So there's some big things happening with Brackenridge Park over the next few years. And the people who oversee the park are asking for the public's input regarding improvements to the park and that entire area. The Brackenridge Park Conservancy is hosting some open houses throughout October and November to get the public's input in helping save the park's ecological system systems and protecting its historical sites. Park officials also want to tell the stories that are part of the park's rich history. So right now on KSAT.com, we have a list of those open houses. So there will be food trucks, giveaways, informational booths, and tours will be available on site as well. So if you just want to go get information on the park's future, what they're doing there, head over there, and you could also uh, maybe pick up some a bite to eat <laughs> and some drinks. Win-win. Yeah, definitely. Okay, guys, well, speaking of outdoors, Sometimes you just want to crack a cold one outside and have, and now we have just the event for local beer lovers. Yes, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 15th annual San Antonio Beer Festival is returning in October. So get this, more than 400 premium and craft beers will be available from more than 100 breweries around the world. So we're going global here at the festival, which takes place October 16th at Crockett Park. And needless to say, you have to be 21 to go. But get this, there will be porters, stouts, pilsners, ales, wheats, sours, Belgian, ciders, lagers, and one-of-kind collaborations and more. I felt like Greg Simmons reading scores right there. <laughs> the San Antonio Beer Festival is hosted, is presented by HEB and a portion of the pro profits benefit the San Antonio Food Bank. So it's good stuff there. And you can find much more information on ksat.com and you could dress up like these guys as well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, get into guess. the spirit of it, right? I still yes. need to order my later hosen. Those are expensive. The good ones. They the are. Yes. Ones. Yeah. yeah. I'm a. I'm more of a pilsner guy. I'm. Uh -huh. not, I like IPAs, but I don't try and drink too many. Yeah, I, I like. Yeah. I like lager. So lagers too. Yeah. I, high five. Oh. Yeah, RJ. Definitely. Thank you very Airfine, yeah. much. <laughs> All right. So uh, one more here. As we get ready for the month of October, we want to let you know about this great article we have on our website with the headline Guide to Halloween and October Events in San Antonio. Not much more to say there. Once again, KSAT digital journalist Mary Claire Patton has put together basically all of your plans for October. This is the spot right here. We have a wizard trivia night. Very uh, Mary Claire on point there, a lot of concerts and shows. The Beach Boys gonna be playing this month. And of course, all of your Halloween fun from mazes to haunted houses, even a dark circus market at the Victoria Swan Inn. Very interesting. So we have a nice mix of free events and festivals and you can find all that information right there on our website, ksat.com. Got Halloween, maybe yeah. change in the temperatures a little bit. So a lot of things happening outdoors, families, fun, good times. Yeah, it's a fun time of year. Yeah, very it busy month. Is. Hopefully the yeah. weather will cooperate. Yes, let's hope. Yeah, I hope it <laughs> kind of stays cool. We're It'd be nice, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, RJ. Yeah, thanks, guys. Outside with live cam, I'll be the first to tell you that this newscast is very much a team effort. Justin Horn just spotted a tweet from TechStot. Apparently there's a big accident on I-35 southbound at York Creek in northern Comal County. An 18-wheeler has overturned. We'll try to get some more information, but right now here's Justin. Thank you, Mark. And yeah, well, if you look outside there, we see some cloudy skies and no rain. So there's uh, no hazards there as far as slick roads or anything like that. But we may start to see some thunderstorms as we get into tonight. Of course, the pollen count, very important. Let's see where we stand today. Molds are moderate. Full elm is moderate. Ragweed is moderate. So molds are down from where they were yesterday, but everything's in a moderate category. Those are your typical fall allergens right there, and they are a little bit elevated today. Temperature wise, 76 in New Braunfels, 79 in Casterville, 77 in Hondo. Pretty extensive amount of morning clouds over the area, so it's going to take a little bit before these sort of thin out and we get some sun this afternoon. But once we do, it'll be a warm and humid day. Here are the headlines. Once again, the sun does pop out later this afternoon. Some isolated storms will develop, but everything today I think is few and far between. It's tonight that we'll keep a very close eye on, especially off to our west and northwest. We can get one of those complexes of storms that will work its way into the area tomorrow morning, it looks like. And then maybe a break before a few more storms 
Friday afternoon and Friday evening. We'll talk much more about this. Plus, we've got more storms on the way Saturday, so a pretty busy stretch here. Maybe a little bit of flash flooding too. the latest on all of that coming up here in just a couple minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. A brand new episode of KSAT Explained is out. And KSAT's Myra Arthur has a preview. This week's episode of KSAT Explains all about a topic that most of us know all too well, sitting in traffic. How do we fight that in San Antonio? What ways uh, will this city address growing congestion, expanding highways, a big part of that solution mm -hmm. proposed? But there are some concerns that go along with that. Samuel King here to explain some of that. Yes, some of the concerns, Myra, just center around the environment, the six, Loop 1604 expansion. Probably should step back and say, uh, two of the big projects we're gonna be focusing on in this episode are Loop 1604 and I-35 on the northeast side. Of course, the Loop 1604 project is underway. If you live and work in that area, you've seen that. And it does go over some very environmentally sensitive area, very environmentally sensitive yes. part of our region. So there are concerns about what that means for the aquifer, for instance, and what that can mean for potential growth as well. Also, I-35 project too, once that gets going, there's this concern about air quality. We've had ozone action days lately. There's some concerns, more regulations are gonna come down from the EPA on that. Will added highways add to that? And furthermore, at the end of the day, will it do what it actually is promising to do and that's reduce congestion. We get into all of that in the episode. And that is, a, you know, that's a huge concern for drivers just being able to get to where they are growing in a city and a county growing like ours is, mm -hmm. is expanding highways the real solution. So we look at that and also ways that we can balance those other issues as well. Like you said, we're just coming off those ozone action days. So something top of mind for people they've probably been hearing about. Check out this episode right now on KSAT Explain, KSAT dot com slash explains or the KSAT TV app. You can watch it anytime on demand. Time right now, 938, about 77 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9, and hounds are known to have long ears, but this dog has enough ears to make it into the Guinness Book of World Records. We're going to tell you all about Lou next on GMSA at 9. Aww. And welcome back, it's 942. Linda's your ears. There's a new Guinness record holder for longest dog ears. CNN's Jeannie Mose reports. She may not be all ears, but she's enough ears to make it into the Guinness Book of World Records for longest ears on a living dog. Good girl. Give Lou a high five for her exceptional coonhound ears. Lou's ears are 13.38 inches long each. They're the same length. We could give you an earful about her cute quirks. The goofiest little weirdo. For instance, how she scratches her chin on the kitchen counter, but her claim to fame is having ears long enough to tie together. And everywhere she goes in her home state of Oregon, for instance, wine tasting with her owner, people are loving on and touching her velvety ears. Rubbing her ears in her world is like getting the best massage you could ever get. When she was a puppy, owner Paige Olson says, She would step on her ears all the time and trip and slide across the ground. Now she manages to step around them. No, she doesn't get ear infections, but they do get dirty. But I like to call them self-washing. They kind of just rinse themselves off in the water bowl. She will suck on her own ears if they get too dirty. The black and tan coonhound was bred with ears long enough to drag in the dirt and stir up old scents of animals so they can track them better. Sassy. But what was Lou tracking off to the side throughout our interview? Paige kept having Lou to turn her head. I am sitting by a French door window and she's staring at herself. Seems she only has eyes for her ears. Or as Carly Simon would sing. You're so famous. Genie Mose, CNN, you don't, you don't, you. New York. She's awesome. Aww. She's beautiful. The puppy shot. You oh, could tell the, then oh, yes. she was going to probably be a Guinness record holder. Exactly. Well, poor thing, tripping, tripping over her own ears was super cute, and, and, she, and she knows it, apparently, oh looking at herself in the 
reflection. Oh boy, next, next stop, the anchor desk. That's the first prerequisite is you like to look at yourself in the mirror. I mean, she's beautiful though, so you know. Yeah, very, very cute. Very, very cute. Very I love Jeannie's so. stories. Yeah. Most, of the, too. Yeah, Most of the time. Most of the time. Those are great. Uh, you know, one thing we do love too around here is a little bit of rain, especially when it's not severe and it's just good hardy rain. We've gotten a little bit of that obviously earlier this week. It's helping with the drought a little bit. So let's take a look at the drought monitor across the state of Texas. Notice that uh, we have some places that are showing up as abnormally dry. That's not necessarily drought, but some places there in the Texas Panhandle certainly starting to drift into the drought territory. We've seen a little bit down here. This is last week, so let's fast forward to this week. And notice the abnormally dry actually spreads out. We see more of it. But this does not take into account Tuesday's rainfall. So when it does, I would imagine that this will probably go away. We were headed towards drought and now we're kind of reversing course here a little bit and that is uh, fantastic news. There's a little closer look and yes, it does have some of our area in the abnormally dry category. When we show you this next week, hopefully that is gone. Here's the scene outside. We're still dealing with cloudy conditions. 76 at the airport, 80 at Stinson, 79 Kelly, 75 Randolph and with these clouds, Temperatures may stay down a little bit for the morning time, but by the time we get into the afternoon and the skies clear a little bit, we'll see these uh, numbers start to jump up. 72 Bernie State, 69 Lost Maples. We're already at 81 in Catula and 80 in Pleasanton. And dew points are sky high. It is sticky. It is humid. There is a ton of humidity out there, and so there will be a little bit of a heat index today, I think, up around 90 with a 30% chance of some showers and storms. Most everything we see today, It'll be isolated. It'll be pop up stuff. So most of us, most of us will stay dry into tonight. And that's when things start to change a little bit. Satellite picture. You can see how uh, expansive these clouds are stretching from San Antonio over towards Bandera, Hondo, Uvalde, seeing some of those morning clouds and then a bit more sun as you get closer to the coast where we are seeing some storms there just off the coast into the Gulf of Mexico. And notice we've got a lot of rain out in parts of New Mexico where our upper level low is spinning. And today there is a slight risk of severe weather stretching from the Big Bend up to Midland back down towards Del Rio. Really west of our area, we will keep an eye on Del Rio tonight as some of these storms develop. Uh, but the main threat would be some hail and gusty winds. Here's how the forecast looks uh, as we get into the afternoon, six o'clock this evening. Still fairly quiet, just a couple of isolated showers and storms, and then we start to see the development out west. By the time we get into tomorrow morning, we've got that cluster of storms working south and east and could be pretty busy for the morning commute tomorrow. You'll want to give yourself some extra time and it does look like we could see some pockets of heavy rain. By four o'clock tomorrow, notice with that complex moving away, things are a little bit quieter. So we could get a break in the action tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening, which would be good, obviously, for Friday night football. But there are more chances for rain on Saturday. Rain chances Look like this 60% chance tonight, 70% chance Friday morning, 40% chance Friday night, and we'll up that again to a 60% chance Saturday. And there could be an additional one to three inches, especially west of San Antonio when we're talking rainfall through Sunday morning. So there could be some flash flooding in spots. 82 tomorrow, there's that 70% chance rain mainly in the morning, 83 Saturday, 60% chance, and then less humid next week with highs in the 80s have that case at weather app nearby. We'll keep you updated guys. Yeah, that'll be really handy the next few days for sure. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Nice. I'm KSAT meteorologist Katie Blake. I not only forecast the weather here at KSAT 12, but I'm also the host of Katie's Science Lab, and this is my assistant, Katie's assistant. You may also know him as David Sears. <laughs> for a little over a year now, we have been conducting some simple yet educational and fun experiments for elementary to middle school age children, live Wednesdays on KSAT's GMSA at nine. Now, we want to bring those experiments to you. So if you're a teacher or a parent who would like us to come visit your school, your class, or your child's class and have them participate in one of our experiments live on TV at 9 o'clock. Let us know. Maybe you are working on your own experiments and you want us to join you. All you have to do is let us know. Just contact Katie. And we'll make the necessary arrangements and then let the science take over with Katie's Science Lab. Thank you guys. 949 about 77 degrees. The Academy Museum of Motion Pictures opens to the public today and next we're going to have a look at the events leading up to the opening. 
952, the long-awaited Academy Museum of Motion Pictures opens officially to the public today. But last night, one final celebration to kick off LA's newest attraction. ABC's George Pinocchio has a story. I feel like everything in cinema this year is really, really pushing to kind of get people really reintegrated into uh, and excited about the industry again. Robert Pattinson hopes the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures will help. He and her are the co-chairs of the final celebration before the beginning of a new era for movie lovers. The opening of this enormous history-filled complex. Everybody, I'm really big on storytelling and these are going to be some of the most inspiring stories. There are people behind the scenes that you're going to find out about that you would never know about before. And um, for me, even as a kid, like when I see somebody that looks like me that's done it, I'm, I'm thinking like I can do this too. There is plenty here to look at, to learn to enjoy and to remember. You know, I definitely want to see um, The Wizard of Oz. It's my grandma's favorite movie and so to see that exhibit would be really cool. It's kind of like trying to share the magic of what it feels like to be inside the process of making a film. That's the whole idea of the uh, museum. So to see it actually come to fruition is quite extraordinary. We preserve the magic, I think, but then we also demystify the filmmaking process so you learn exactly what it takes to make movies. The guests here are excited to be a part of something special that's anchored in the middle of Los Angeles, a treasure trove of movie history. My dream is that there is some legally blonde moment in the Academy uh, Museum. So if it isn't there, I, I brought something. I'm going to tack it up on the wall tonight and we'll see how long it stays there. The Academy Museum of Motion Pictures opens to the public today. In Los Angeles, George Pinocchio for ABC News. All right, a quick check of the roads with TransGuide. Let's look there at 281 and Loop 410. At least in this area, things look okay. Now, two other notes for you real quick. Southbound 35 up in northern Comal County, there is a big rig rollover. TxDOT says to expect delays, and we have not yet heard from our Katrina Weber at the scene of that shooting involved a deputy who is okay. We understand a suspect was taken to the hospital out in West Bear County. We mentioned that breaking news top of the newscast. We'll try to get some more information online, and of course, look for more on the news at noon. And you can see it's fairly cloudy out there. We're going to start off cloudy with some sun, some sun this afternoon, about a 30% chance of some isolated storms, better chances of rain tonight, early tomorrow morning. That morning commute tomorrow could be wet, could be stormy, so take some extra time. We told you about a bunch of stuff happening in October. This next event we're going to tell you about is in November. Yeah, so this is the fourth annual Fideo Loco Festival. And it's going to be on the south side, of course, November 6th from noon to 4 at Far West San Antonio at 2502 Pleasanton Road. Tickets on sale now. You can find the article on KSAT.com. General admission, $15 online, $20 at the door. Yeah, so tickets can be purchased online or the day of the event. And kids 12 and under, they can get in for free. All right, it includes unlimited Fidel samples, a token to vote your, for your favorite for people's choice, and access to local market vendors, music, and a bar all day. That's right. Uh, the cook-off, sorry, Fideo Loco Festival and cook-off was founded by Roxanne Gonzalez-Quintero, and her mission was to celebrate the delicious Fideo dish. Sounds good. Yeah, it does. Mm. Have a great day.